Boil water, cook fast, and survive. Get yours today, KellyKettleUSA.com. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, which can be found on our website at TreyerWilderness.com and also on iTunes. Welcome to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where we are homesteading traditionally 100% off-grid today and offering preparedness and survival tips for tomorrow. Here's your host, Tammy Treyer. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me today on Mountain Woman Radio. It is a snowy day here in northern Idaho. We're not getting a lot of snow, but it's one of those gray days and the Flurries are coming down here and there. I hope you're all well, and I hope you're all safe and snuggly uh, this time of year. It's been in the low teens here in the mornings, so it's been pretty cold, and we're all we're all nestled in for the winter and enjoying the warmth of the fire. I've got a deer roast on the wood stove, so up in my office here, it is just smelling quite amazing. That tantalizing smell going through my house all day is just awesomeness. And the mountain boy got his uh, deer today, so his tag is filled, and deer season is over at the end of today. So all is good, and um, getting our canning shells full. But today, I have a really great guest on today. You can find her in our giving guide, and you can find that at treyerwilderness.com slash giving guide. And she's got a lot to share on chickens. I'd like to introduce you to Mayotte Van Eidert. And she is from thefrugalchicken.com. How are you doing today, Mayotte? Good. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I'm glad to have you and, and glad for you to share all your knowledge on chickens because I know so many people are so interested in embracing having hens on their homestead or on their, on their acreage. And they're just so afraid because there's so much information out on the Internet. So without taking away from what you have to share. I'm just going to give you the floor and let you share about your um, your story and how you got started and, and the things that you do on your homestead. Sure. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the reasons I started Frugal Chicken was because there is so much information out there. And, you know, especially like on Facebook, for example, um, you know, you see those questions every day, you know, how, you know, why does my chicken do this? So my chicken has this illness. And all the answers are so you know, all over the place, and, and none of them are from a vet, none of them are from a chicken expert. So I started Frugal Chicken as a way to sort of cut through all of that confusion mm-hmm. to give people the information, the research-backed information that they need. So that's you know, that's really the reason why I started it. Yep. Um, you know, I, I started my homestead, you know, several years ago, and I found that chickens were sort of the gateway for a lot of people into the homesteading life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you understand all of that. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, and chickens being so important to the homesteading experience and to the, you know, sort of self-sufficient experience, their health and answering all those questions and having that information available to people, you know, became sort of really important to me. Yeah. Totally get that, and it is. It's it is. They are the gateway to homesteading because you get one chicken, and you end up with chickens and rabbits and goats and all kinds of fun things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't. Take we've much. become that that place that everyone drops their chickens off at. <laughs> also, <laughs> yes, that happens on occasion too. We had some that we adopted as well. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get? So to- that that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you, so how did you get involved in homesteading? What was your lore? You know, it, it's interesting because it, the real sort of spark occurred several years ago. Um, I was living in Washington, D.C., and we still own a condo there, but I was living in this condo in the D.C. metro area. And, you know, it, just, it was boring. And, you know, I had, in order to get food, I had to go to the grocery store and, you know, as, you know, sort of, time went on, I started learning about homesteading, but 
there was nothing out there at that time. You know, we're talking like 2006, 2007. Right. There was really nothing out there on the Internet at that time people how to homestead by themselves, like not by themselves, but how to homestead like in an apartment, for example. Or, right. um, you know, at the time you know, there was sort of this idea that you had to have large tracts of land. Right. So you know, sort of fast forward a number of years later, I met my husband. Um, he was in the Army, and he was based at um, Arlington National Cemetery, and he was from the middle of nowhere in the Midwest, mm -hmm. and he had been farming his whole life. That's what he knows. Right. Um, and so it sort of just sort of rekindled that desire in me to, you know, live a more self-sufficient life. And it really is the self-sufficient aspect of it that, that intrigues me more mm -hmm. than sort of any other part of the homesteading experience. Because, you know, you, you're, you're in control of your food supply, you're in control of, you know, all these different aspects of living mm -hmm. that otherwise you're really dependent on other people for, which never made any sense to me, <laughs> you know? Yes, absolutely. Amen. It's, it's, uh, it's addicting, the, the self-sufficient side of yeah. things, it, just the whole aspect of it, because it's so broad, is so addicting. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, and and so that was sort of really how I came to to you know start our homestead and to keep all my chickens, um, just because you know and, and at that time that I was living in the D.C. metro area, I was really limited. I couldn't own chickens. Nice. Um, the county that we lived in, they required you could own chickens, but they had to be twenty five feet away from any other home or anything. Right. So you know, in living in a condo, of course. You know, I was sitting there for years going, how could I possibly have chickens in my apartment that were 25 feet away from everyone else? And, and I had these cathedral ceilings, and I was like, can I hang it from, you know, the ceiling? And, and it never would have worked because we have a terrible HOA there, and the second they found out, they would have maybe get rid of them. Right. But, um, you know, so for years, I, just, I, I spent all this time doing this and trying to sort this all out. And then finally, one day, we just sort of bit the bullet and said, forget this, you know, we were in a situation where we were keeping the condo to keep our jobs, we were keeping our jobs to keep the condo, yep. and I just looked at my husband one day and was just like, this sucks. Yeah. I don't, you know, this, this just, we hate living here, we hate this, this HOA, we, you know, there's all this traffic everywhere, we hate driving, let's just forget it, and, you know, we, we just sort of bit the bullet and bought a farm. Awesome. Awesome. And that's the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. Dive well, in. And, and that's the thing I think I want people to know is that, you know, there's never like a right time to homestead. You, know, you just sort of have to bite the bullet and do it. Yeah. That's, that's really good advice because so many people think themselves right out of these opportunities and wait for that perfect timing on everything. And 30 years later, they realize they've missed their opportunities because they're either too old to embrace it or, you know, things have gone a different direction. But I don't like leaving any stones unturned. So that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so you bought your farm and then mm -hmm. and where did you guys end up then? Um, we are in the South, like in the Midwest, kind of like where the South and the Midwest meet. Okay. Um, you know, we're you know, near Arkansas, near the Ozarks, kind of that kind of area. Okay. Okay. Which so is... it's it's in the summers, it's nice and super hot, and but and then the winters, you know, they're a little bit more mild. Right. So that that's nice. Nice, nice. Now, did you move to something with a lot of acreage, or did you? Um, what did? And you're at the same place now, correct? Yep. Yep. And no, actually, we only have ten acres. Okay. And that's something else I think is really interesting because what's, what's actually most interesting about our homesteading experience that I think a lot of people is sort of a misconception about homesteading. Mm -hmm. We actually only do most of our homesteading on two acres of land on a farm. Okay. Um, but we have, we have 10 acres. Okay. So, you know, we, we have pigs, we have chickens, we have rabbits, we have horses, we have, you know, turkeys, ducks, we have quail, <laughs> We have so many animals, but we mostly only do our homesteading on two acres. Okay. So, um, you know, so our meat chickens have free range of the, of the property. Mm -hmm. um, our laying chickens are kept more in like a coop and run area for their state-owned safety and stuff. Right. 
but we actually only have 10 acres of land, and at this point, we have five acres that are still unused, which we're trying to figure out how to use them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because ourselves, we only have five acres. You know, you don't need to have gobs of land to embrace such an opportunity, you know, so that is yeah. important for people to know because people live vicariously through all of us and, and think that that's an essential part of it and that they can't get started unless they have that. But there's so many means of getting started in a self-sufficient lifestyle and homesteading even. Yeah, and that's one of the, sort of one of the focuses of frugal chicken is teaching people these sort of self-reliant and traditional skills that can really be learned anywhere. So I talk a lot on the blog about how to make bread and fermenting and how to, you know, um, you know, take mar- uh, farmer market produce and can it yep. so people have a resource for these skills so that, that when, you know, like I couldn't, you know, several years ago, I couldn't in my condo, I couldn't imagine doing this stuff. Right. But I want people to have an accessible way to learn these traditional skills yep. so that they can homestead in a small space and it's actually more advantageous to learn these skills, you know, in a small, when you live in a small space, like an apartment, for example, mm-hmm. because the first thing we learned when we moved to our homestead is this is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work keeping up a farm and all the fencing and, you know, horses break down fences every day. Yep. And if I had spent those years learning some of these traditional skills, mm-hmm. it probably would have served me better in the long run. Yeah. So I try on the blog to talk a lot about, um, not just raising chickens, which is, you know, sort of the main focus of the blog, but also a lot of these, you know, old-timey traditional skills that anybody can do anywhere. Right, right. And that is really good advice because if you have a kitchen or even if you have a patio, you know, or a yard that you have access to, you know, you can can. You can can on a, mm-hmm. a gas burner. You can can on a, a electric stove. You know, there's means of canning and it's such a great way to, to be able to um, feed your family on whole and organic foods, you know, that, you're, that are grown locally. And, and to be able to learn that skill is huge because right now we have a lot of um, game meat to put on our canning shelves this year again. So we, ha- we will be canning um, a lot of venison upcoming. And, and I'm so grateful to have the skills and to be able to put that meat on the shelf. It makes it so easy to pull that meat down and just open a can. You can eat it right out of the can because it's already been processed. So, so many benefits yeah. to that. Well, and one thing that I've, I've started to fall in love with is, you know, what you're exactly what you're doing. You're processing meat. We bought a meat grinder and yes. they're shockingly inexpensive. We got one for $150. Yep. And we actually um, used a, a rebate coupon to purchase most of it. So I ended up only spending $30 yep. for a really high-quality meat grinder. And, you know, you can go to, even if you live in the inner city, you can go to a grocery store, purchase bulk quantities of, like, a pork shoulder, for example, mm-hmm. and grind that up and make your own sausage and process your own sausage in your own kitchen. And that's a traditional skill that anybody can do anywhere. Yep. Yes, and and to be able to do that with your own meats is just so priceless. And grinding the meats like that is, we we have a vacuum sealer and we have the meat grinder. We have both electric and we also have the uh, hand crank. Um, just we always like to have both sets of tools so that if there is ever no power for whatever reason, that we have the equipment to to be able to do what we need to do. But it's so it's so nice to be able to do that. I, I just feel very blessed to be able to fill my canning shelves every year. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you on the um, the like the handheld grinders and everything. We yep. do have those. My husband was actually able to scrounge one up for free for me from <laughs> an elderly neighbor who just wanted to give it away. Yeah. Um, yeah. They just want well. That, that's that's another thing that says sort of you know going down a different path right now. But sure. It's, Something that struck me very interesting about the area that we live in is there's a lot of older, um, the older generation here, okay. and a lot of them have helped us out just by giving us stuff mm-hmm. because they see that we're interested in these sort of you know traditional skills that they did when they were children. Sure. You know, and we're talking about neighbors who are like in their 80s, right. and they just want their materials, you know, their their goods that they used when they were younger to go to a good home. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's another advantage that. A lot of people, you know, in 
no matter where you are, can take advantage of is if you show an interest in some of these skills, a lot of the older generation will do everything that they can to help you out. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad you went on that path because that is so true. And the other thing is to hone in on their knowledge because I, mm -hmm. my grandparents have passed a long time ago and, you know, I gained what I could from them, but gosh, if I could sit down with them now, you know, and just pick their brains. And, and when, if you have older people that have lived through the depression, I encourage you guys to sit down and just pick their brains, sit and have a conversation, ask them about the times and the things they did because they are such a wealth of information. And that's so cool because cast iron and all those things that, that they used to use are typically up in their attics or in their basements not being used because they don't have the strength to use them anymore. But the tools are last a lifetime, you know, because they were built better yeah. in that day. Yeah, our, our handheld meat grinder is... Um, it's an antique, and it's yeah. and I actually took the, uh, the the name is imprinted on the side of the the cast iron, and I actually ran it through a search engine on the internet, and it's from you know the Depression era. Yeah. So and it's still fully serviceable. You can clean it and use it and everything, it, and and it's just it's just amazing. Yeah. Well, my my walls in my home are filled with antiques, both um, indoor and outdoor antiques, meaning that I have saws hanging on my walls and drill old drills. They come off and they get used. Out, you know, my husband will take them out and use them to cut a tree. And I've got all the other uh, kitchen appliances hanging on my walls, and I'll just take them down and wash them off and use them. You know, and it's so awesome to have them and be able to utilize them. And I just wish I could, you know, they could tell the story of their use. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take a short break real quick to hear some words from our sponsors, and we'll be right back to continue speaking with Mayot. Stay tuned. The new Pioneer Magazine, taking the skills and techniques of yesteryears and combining it with solar, hydroponics, and various other advancements of today, creating the most robust pioneering magazine on the market. In addition to the new Pioneer Magazine, they also have available the American Frontiersman Magazine, taking you back to a more primitive time, and both magazines can be found at newpioneermag.com. Get your copies today and be prepared for tomorrow. Do you have a loved one or are you suffering from celiac disease or a gluten intolerance? Trying to find that perfect flour? Whether you are baking cookies, flaky pie crust, or baking breads from scratch, or you are looking for a quick cake from a package, look no further. Better Batter offers non-GMO gluten-free products with an assortment of packaged items as well as flour packaged in varying sizes, including their bulk sizes. Perfect for those of you that are practicing your preparedness skills. Better Batter is not just another gluten-free flour. It's what you have been searching for. Visit betterbatter.org. Do you have your free digital subscription to Prepare Magazine yet? If not, then hurry over to preparemag.com and start getting each monthly issue sent directly to your inbox. It's easy. All you have to do is go to preparemag.com, enter your name and email address, and you're subscribed. Consider signing up for the premium membership for past issues and exclusive resources. You can even subscribe to the beautiful print version of Prepare Magazine. Visit preparemag.com and choose the option that's most valuable to you. Prepare Magazine, encouraging, empowering, and enriching your journey. Fall is here. This year, get your Christmas shopping done early and give the gift that keeps on giving for years to come. Everyone would love to receive a Kelly Kettle, especially for emergency preparedness, camping, scouts, fishing, or any other outdoor activity. No batteries, no gas, no worries. All you need is a handful of sticks and twigs, and you'll have boiling hot water in three to five minutes. The Kelly Kettle is the most versatile and valuable piece of camping or emergency preparedness equipment you can own. It's lightweight, portable, and durable enough to last for years. And there's no running costs or fuel canisters to buy, ever. You can start a fire and boil water ultra-fast in even the worst weather, protected from both the wind and rain. You can boil water and cook food all at the same time. Right now, you can get a special discount on the Kelly Kettles or Kelly Kettle Ultimate Kits by using our special promo code, TRAYER5. Go to kellykettleusa.com and enter the promo code in the coupon box during checkout and receive $5 off their already low prices. On top of that, if you order a Kelly Kettle Ultimate Kit, they'll ship it to you free. Have the most versatile compact camping kit and get it for a great price. All at kellykettleusa.com. Or give them a call at 208-359-3123. Kelly Kettle backs up every kettle they sell. 
boil water, cook fast, and survive. Get yours today. KellyKettleUSA.com. Okay, we are back. And again, we are speaking with Mayotte Van Eidert. And she is yep. from TheFrugalChicken.com and has been sharing some of her story with us. But I would love to hear some more um, from you, Mayotte, on your uh, heritage and, and that, if you don't mind sharing. Sure, no, no problem. Um, my name is actually Dutch. My grandfather, his family came over to this country from Holland back in you know, the early early twentieth century. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, they settled actually in Utah, where my uh, great grandfather was a gardener, believe it or not, for the University of Utah. Oh, cool. So at that point in time, out, yeah, out in Utah, um, you know, it was it was well established. Um, on my grandmother's side, believe it or not. They were actually the Mormon pioneers who traveled from uh, Illinois over to Utah during the you know, early part of the um, 19th century in order to settle Utah. So they were some of the first settlers and homesteaders wow. in the Utah Salt Lake City area. Area. Nice. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I'd never really sort of thought about that part of my background until one day I was here on the homestead and... I was, you know, doing something, and I said, you know, interestingly enough, this is this is kind of in my blood to be doing that. It's, it's <laughs> you know, something I just never, all all those years of reading about homesteading and you know, learning all these skills, it never sh- struck me until like one day it was like, bing, you know. <laughs> well, I I think this is probably something that my great grandparents probably did. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, that's awesome. And, and you know, it, it, our roots are still in us. You know, we might see things as kids and it doesn't really register a whole lot. But as we become adults, those roots start to uh, surface. And I, I just treasure the times I have with my grandparents and learning what I did learn and, and, you know, being able to grow up the way I did on a farm. You know, that was just an awesome opportunity. But there's no reason, you know, if you didn't grow up on a farm that you can't embrace these things, you know, like you've mentioned and and be able to, like, knowledge is power. That's the way I look at things. If you're willing to educate mm-hmm. yourself and learn, you know, the different skills and things that are available to you, you know, you, you are really enhancing your life and your future. Yeah, you know, and it, it's like we were talking about earlier, you know, chickens are kind of the gateway to all of that for a lot of people <laughs> because from chickens, you know, you get the food, um, you get the eggs, you get the, you get the meat, Um and it's just it's just been a really interesting journey from the time that we bought this property until until today. Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. I'm sure that you were just as guilty as we were of being anxious to go out and see how many eggs were out there and making a little uh, <laughs> chalkboard of how many you got each day. And <laughs> I, I still do that. Many years later, I, it's like Christmas every morning when I go and, and find their eggs. So, yes. And one thing that, you know, I have learned over the years is that the quality of what you feed your chickens, you know, in large part affects the quality of their eggs. Very true. Um, and so one thing I've done with um, with my site is, you know, like I said, I, I built my site so that it could be researched back so people could trust what they're reading. Right. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reading like PubMed and reading um, industry journals and stuff so that the information on there is, is accurate. Yeah. And so a lot of the studies I read have indicated that, the quality of what chickens eat indi- um, indicates the quality of the eggs that they produce. It's pretty interesting. So learning things like fermenting, which is a, a traditional skill, that's become pretty important to me, learning how to ferment food and ferment chicken feed and stuff like that. Yeah, awesome. So you make your own chicken feed then? Yep, we, we do make our own chicken feed, and right now we're producing a lot of what we do feed on, on our property. Um, that became kind of important to me pretty quickly in order to reduce cost. Yes. Um, which, as I'm sure you know, with chicken feed can get pretty expensive. Right. Um, I remember seeing on a video that you did that most of your chicken uh, chicken flock is cooped because of predators. Right. Right. Um, right. And so foraging, you know, for a lot of people, especially people like in cities who want to keep chickens, but they're not allowed to let the chickens forage. Right. It can get pretty expensive. Yeah. So we try to focus a lot on growing peas and and beans and stuff like that, that that the chickens can eat. And wheat, wheat is a big one for us, um, fodder. So yeah. um, I've spent a lot of time learning how to do that and how to make it productive for chickens so that their eggs are nutritious. Yeah, yeah. And that's really important today, too, with 
all the GMOs because that travels mm-hmm. through into the into what the byproducts of the chicken. Um, like for my son, um, we have to be really careful that we're not feeding the chickens anything that's wheat because he has a wheat allergy. And so that, and, and you will, you know, some people, he will especially have struggles with, you know, anything, you know, an egg that came from a chicken that ate wheat. And we have a friend that gets really, really sick and another uh, guest right now, you know, with GMOs, they, they really are so toxic to our bodies and, And our bodies are so sensitive, and I'm realizing that, too, in my health situation right now, that some of the things I was trying to weed out weren't so much the ingredients as much as it was the GMOs in the ingredients. And so it's it's pretty scary with our food for ourselves, and then you've got to consider what you're feeding your chickens. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what what you said is, is, you know, completely accurate. I've read a lot of studies, you know, one study in particular – that was done um, in 20, 2009 um, in Denmark, showed that the quality of the hen's diet, and in this case they fed them fermented feed, yeah. um, reduced the amount of pathogens in the chicken's gut and, in, and then, again, in the chicken's eggs. Yeah. Um, so they studied the eggs once, you know, once the study was over, they, they looked at all the eggs and found that, you know, there were lower instances of salmonella and E. coli. So, what they eat definitely does dictate the quality of the egg that you're in turn going to be eating. Yes. So I spend a lot of time researching that and writing about it on my website, Frugal Chicken, and I've come out with a course that's coming out in January that focuses entirely on feeding chickens the most nutritious diet possible so that what you eat is also nutritious. Awesome. Awesome, which is so important. And a lot of people struggle, I know we do in our area, in finding non-GMO feeds. Um, I don't, honestly, at this point, have the time to make feed for my chickens, but I am interested in your in your course, though, because I'd like to learn how to do that so that, you know, moving forward, we have that knowledge. But to get non-GMO feeds here, we'd have to go hours to, to find it or pay expensive shipping to get it here. And it's mm-hmm. important. It's real important. So to be able to make your own feed is is an awesome way to do things. Well, in, in the same vein, the course doesn't just focus on making your own feeds. You know, there, there is a module in there that teaches you how to do that with specific recipes and what you can put in, you know, substitution. So if, like, for example, in my area, barley isn't readily accessible, but uh, non-GMO wheat is. Okay. So there's different recipes in there with substitutions. But the course also focuses on... Um, commercial feeds and how to find non-GMO commercial feeds and stuff like that. So, and how to transform them into, you know, using fermenting and fodder and stuff like that into something super nutritious because not like, like, just like you, not everybody has the time or the ability or even the inclination to make their own chicken feed. So I wanted to be able to serve that market as well as the people who like, you know, formulating their their own feeds and stuff. Right. Awesome. Good for you. That's awesome. And it's really important because so many people are looking for things. And, again, it's one of those deals where you just don't know where, where to look or to find all the details. So that's fantastic. And does your course basically do kind of like a soup to nuts on chickens then? It's soup to nuts on feeding your chickens. Okay. Um, and the purpose of it is, you know, I tell people it's, it teaches you to feed your chickens the most nutritious diet possible so that you can have the most nourishing eggs possible and meat. Okay. So the most nourishing eggs and meat possible. Great, great. Um, and like I said, it, it, it's sort of like a six nuts, but there's also an option in the course itself to purchase so the, to purchase an additional module. Okay. Um, and that module focuses on uh, illnesses and how to identify illnesses, and I walk people through how I identify them with my chicken flock, and there's a ton of video on there um, showing you specific situations, you know, so for, so for example, if a chicken turned up sick one day, I turned on the video camera and showed, you know, took footage of what I was doing so that people could benefit from that. Excellent. Excellent. That's awesome. And then you also have a uh, free audio guide available to them as well with the five ways to feed your hens right today that would go along with that as well. Yep. So um, you can go ahead and purchase the course itself at feedingyourhensright.com, or if you want to, you can, you can also grab the free course, which is Five Ways to Feed Your Hens Right Today, 
um, which is at thefrugalchicken.com slash VIP list. Okay. And that's sort of a very, you know, brief course where you can learn five things that you can do today to help feed your, your chickens. And then, you know, the course itself, Beating Your Hens Right, goes more in depth into the soup to nuts, nuts and bolts of how to feed your chickens. Right. Okay, awesome. So if you're not in the, if my audience isn't in the market right now or unable to with the holidays to purchase the course, they have the free course they can get started and they can certainly come back in in the new year and and then continue to further educate themselves but i think this is great because it's it is a big topic of discussion in our home because oftentimes in order to go totally non-gmo it can be really costly in finding the replacements for things so i'm i'm really interested in looking into this with you um to see how we can do things different and what we could do here to uh feed our chickens with what we make because right now my health is in, I'm having struggles with my health, but the new year I'm planning on going gangbusters when I'm feeling well again and um, being able to embrace such things. That's because it's really important to me to be able to feed all of our animals um, properly so that we are benefiting from it. And moving forward, if things fall apart, we also have the skills to continue to provide for the, our animals when things may not be available. Yeah, and that's that's a really important skill to have. Yeah. Um, the thing I should mention about the course is right now, um, people can purchase it for thirty seven dollars, um, and I'm in a pre launch mode, a pre sale mode right now. Yep. Um, so when the course is actually completed, which will be in January, the price will double. Okay. So if you know you, price is a concern, getting into it right now might be better than waiting until after it launches in January. Excellent. But of course, you know it's completely up to to people and, and whatever works for their budget. Absolutely, but thank you for pointing that out because I, I forgot that I wanted to mention that to them too because um, with the holidays coming, it's also a great gift idea if you you have somebody mm -hmm. that is really into chickens and, and is you know, a family member that's asking these kind of questions. It's a great way to gift something educational. You know, so many of our products are throwaway products anymore that we give as gifts where when you can give knowledge it's lifetime knowledge so i always encourage people to yep. you know utilize such gifts and and to uh really hone in on on your skills so that's awesome really awesome yeah what's really nice about it is um if you're somebody who waits until the very last second to get that mm -hmm. gift for somebody and you're like, oh, my goodness, it's December 24th. What am I going to do? This is an instantaneous gift because you'll be true. sent immediately a, a login ID and a password, and you can just turn around and say, here's your gift. Awesome. Um, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny because I was setting up a gift-giving guide for uh, my audience on my Facebook page, and on December 24th, I was, like, searching for, like, what should I put in as the gift I suggest to people on this day. And I was, like, I am going to suggest my course because <laughs> I know that there is some husband out there who hasn't gotten his wife or his mother a gift yep. or his sister a gift. And I know I'm going to be saving that guy's butt <laughs> by mentioning <laughs> that this is a digital gift that you will get instantaneously. There's no shipping on it. There's no shipping cost on it. You don't have to wait for it. Yeah. You input your credit card information, and it's right there. Awesome. And it's not like a gift certificate, too, where the gift certificate, you know, you have to wait for it to arrive, or you have to print out a a printable one or get a special code. This is this is excellent. Good, good thought. Yeah. <laughs> I will remember that when I'm doing my social media on the 24th for you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to share with you, too, you had said about my chickens. Uh, we did actually start free ranging our chickens this year, and it had oh, they were just so much happier. And it's so cool to look out the window oh, really? and see the chickens just roaming around. You know, I'd be doing my dishes, and all of a sudden, there's there's my Buff Worthington's out in the yard. You know, so it's it's nice. However, w you know, we do have the predators, and we have been watching, and we have been very lucky. But we had twelve chickens last night, and this morning we only have four. So we had a oh, wow. and they were oh, actually wow. in their coop, but something got in and got to them. So you do have that struggle, but it's part of homesteading. It's part of, it's part of life. And, and, yep. you know, it is what it is. Oftentimes we'll hear something going on that we can go out and take care of, of the situation. But cause we typically sleep with our window open because it gets too hot in our house with the wood stove and we didn't have the window open last night. So something got to them, whether it was a weasel or a possum or 
I'm not, and it's too frozen to tell. There were no tracks out there, you know, so I couldn't, I couldn't tell what got in. But we at least have four left. Yeah, and we, we'll rebuild in spring. We have a, we, we have a real problem with possums in our area. Yeah. Um, every night I go out. We have a we have a pasture raised meat chickens that we you know sell to people around here, and um, every night I have to go out there and put them in the coop physically, like. Pick yeah. up each, you know, 50 chickens and put them in the coop because I don't want to find them strewn all over the yard by a possum, you know? And, yes. and my husband was like, there's no possums around here. And then last night or like two nights ago, I opened up the back door to go check on my turkey and there was a big old possum there. Yeah. Yeah. We have raccoon. We have, we have eagles. We have owls. You know, they're in it. They're, they're fenced in and the, and it's a covered fenced in, you know, coop. But something actually got underneath. Um, our Rhodesian Ridgeback yeah. had roughed up the side of the chicken coop a little bit, and or the fencing, and we had fixed it. But it 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 made it a little more vulnerable. So unfortunately, that happened. That was last night's experience. But you know, it's like I said, it's part of homesteading. It's really part of life because if you lived in the city, you'd still get a flat tire on your vehicle or whatever. You know, yeah. stuff happens. So it's part of it. But. Um, it is definitely a blessing to have animals on the homestead and to be able to produce your own foods. And, and all the animals have such character. Uh, we had our milk oats, which we had to get rid of this winter um, with my health conditions. And they, were, they would follow me around the homestead. I could not go anywhere without my goats following me. It was the absolute funniest thing. So it just makes it unique and it makes it fun to have them, you know, have the animals and, and more priceless to have the, fee, the food. Yep. Yeah. But, Matt, we are running out of time, but I would love to open up the floor one last time to you and allow you to uh, give any words of encouragement you might have for my audience. You know, my one piece of advice is just, you know, if you're considering homesteading, if you are concerned that you need to have large tracts of land to homestead, just bite the bullet and learn the traditional skills, and you can learn most of these skills no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a lot of guides on my site, which is thefrugalchicken.com, and just, you know, enjoy the experience. Just take, you know, they say that the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Yes. And, you know, that, that's a really true, you know, sort of adage that we tell people. Just pick one thing and go with it and, you know, then just start building because, you know, the next thing you know, six months from now, you'll be looking back and you'll have all these skills that you didn't have, you know, six months ago. Yep. And you'll be a much happier person for it. Very true. And very good advice, Matt. Very good advice. And everybody that's listening, you can find all the information in the show notes. But again, her site is thefrugalchicken.com. And her class can be found at feedingyourhensright.com. And if you were interested in the free class that she mentioned, um, you can find that at thefrugalchicken.com slash VIP list, L-I-S-T. So check that out. And may I, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a real pleasure, and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. <laughs> Well, same here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome, and I welcome you back anytime, especially when you have something new going on, and and that will that will definitely get you back on here because I'm sure once your your class starts, I'm sure there will be other classes to follow. It's just as addicting as educating people as much as it is gaining the knowledge. <laughs> You got that right. <laughs> it's a passion of all of ours, so I love that, and I love having people like yourself on that share that passion. So thank you again, and everybody, thank you so much for joining me, and until our next show, you guys take care, and God bless. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where you will learn something new every week. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to join us at treyerwilderness.com, and be sure to connect with us on iTunes. Remember, your reviews on iTunes are very important to us and help us reach more people just like you. 